Uh, dear guests, uh, my name is Johan Beckmann and I wish you welcome to uh, the press studio of uh, Donetsk People's Republic uh, representative office in Helsinki. We are discussing in our conference and in the studio hybrid threats in Europe and in the world in general. And our guest today is uh, uh, Secretary of the Representative Office of Donetsk People's Republic in Helsinki, Mr. Jarmo Ekman. Welcome, Jarmo. Thank you. Nice to see you in Helsinki after seeing you many times in uh, Donetsk and uh, Lugansk. Uh, please tell me, um, how long time have you spent in uh, Donbass uh, recently? Uh, yes, so altogether I think it was, uh, it was nine months. So, so my first visit was uh, last summer in, in uh, July with, uh, with the Finnish tourist group. And uh, then after, shortly after that I, I joined the Donai International Press uh, Center uh, under, under Janusz Putkonen. And I worked for him for approximately uh, nine months. Mm -hmm. So you visited uh, Donbass first as a tourist, but you liked it so much that you wanted to stay there. Well, yes, in fact, in, in fact it was so. So I, I really... I uh, enjoyed my stay. Of course, I felt that the cause was very important. The, the, the people that I met, uh, you know, it gave me, uh, you know, a cause that I want to follow and I want to help uh, get the word out from this region. Mm -hmm. And what, what was this uh, tourist trip of Finnish tourists about? Well, yeah, so it was, it was just um, <clears throat> a tourist group that was uh, arranged by Donai. Um, in fact, just a group of ordinary citizens that uh, that saw an advertisement just m as myself on on Facebook, mm -hmm. and, uh, and 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 replied to it, and and with their own uh, expenses, spend a week in in Donbas um, just as a actually very ordinary tourists. Uh, we were at the at the beach and, and and at the bars, but we also saw the saw the front line action, not the actually action, but the front line, and uh, and and so forth. So it was it was a very interesting trip. Mm -hmm. And wha what else did you see uh, except the beach and the front line in the tourists? Uh, okay, let me, let me, well we, for instance, we, we went around uh, the cities on, on um, city tours. So just uh, as, uh, let's say, an ordinary uh, citizen would, we went to uh, some museums and so forth. Um, then we spend, uh, spent some time in, in Lugansk as well, <coughs> so it was arranged into the tour. Um, and then, yes, so then, then um, uh, we, we um <coughs> spent some time at the uh, MH17 uh, uh, memorial. So it, it, was the, it was the day of the crash, so we were at the memorial site mm -hmm. during that time. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did the Finnish tourists uh, think about, uh, about what they saw in Donbass? Well, I think it's a, it's a <coughs> good question. Of course, I cannot speak for the other people. Uh, I, can, I can try to. Uh, you know, tell about the moods uh, with the mm. trip, but I think it was a very positive experience altogether. Uh, I think we had a great group, so we got along very well. Um, um, I think everybody was satisfied, there was no problems uh, whatsoever. So, so everybody, uh, I think um, all the people that had joined the group, they were somehow already interested in Donbass. So they were not just ordinary tourists in that sense, that they would have gone to look for a beach or a, a cheap uh, pint of beer, but they were already interested in the situation in the mm -hmm. area. So, um, yeah, so I, I think everybody got, uh, at least uh, this is my impression, and I can speak for myself, you know, uh, that, let's say first-hand knowledge on what is going on over there. This is, I think, a situation quite often that when there's a conflict abroad, be it in Syria or in Donbass, uh, we are often, we have to rely on the, on the media to tell us what the situation is and, and unfortunately I have personally come to the conclusion that I cannot always rely on the media on, on the, how they portray a, a certain situation. Mm -hmm. But in our conference uh, here in Helsinki we are discussing uh, hybrid threats. So what is uh, in your opinion is the, the, the most serious hybrid threat in Europe today? Yes. Yeah, so. so uh, I think this is a, this is a sort of a, <clears throat> a new word that has appeared in the in the past year, two years at least. Personally, I had not heard about hybrid threats uh, threats before. So so this is something that has uh, apparently now come and it, it threatens the, the the European Union and the and the people here. So 
of course, uh, to hear that such a threat has uh, uh, appeared, it's, it's um, unconcerning. And I think the way it's been portrayed in the, in the media and by the <coughs> government is that uh, uh, it, the th threat mainly comes from, from the Russian side. And I think uh, it, it, in, in the um, perspective of, of, let's say, EU and NATO, it is, the, it is the Russian media. And then also, on the other hand, we talk about these uh, little green men, sort of this um, hybrid um, uh, war thre uh, threat that, that could, uh, could uh, possibly threaten the, the European countries. But personally, my, my opinion is that <coughs> there is no such threat from, from, Ru from Russian side, uh, be it on the media front or from the, from the, uh, from the uh, military front. On the other hand, I think we, have a, we, we could almost say that we have a hybrid uh, threat from, from, the, from our, our own media, be in the sense that uh, we are not given the correct information and, and quite a lot of information is omitted and quite a lot of information is wrong. And uh, I, I, I believe that threatens the people's ability to, to make decisions and really to understand the situation. So I would, I would even call that a hybrid threat so, so that people are not able to make um, decisions based on correct information. So you think that the, the main hybrid threat in uh, Europe is the European mass media? Yes, I would say so, yes. So you said that uh, the European mass media is giving wrong information. And uh, so what kind of wrong information the mass media is giving? Well, I think it's, uh, we have to, of course, look at the, the particular topic. But uh, if we, for instance, look at Donbass, uh, the time I spent there, of course, the conflict was, was relatively quiet. I mean, there was not that much in the, in the let's say, the Finnish, Finnish media about the conflict. But whenever something was, was written, it was, it was written, um, let's say, with the, with the mouth of, uh, of the Ukrainian authorities, which are one of the warring parties in, in, the, in the conflict. So it is, not, it is not neutral in that sense. I think the neutrality is missing and, and we're not getting a neutral picture. And uh, when, when the message is not neutral, then, then the people do not get the truth. I think you know, both sides uh, definitely should get a voice in this. So why the Western mass media doesn't want to take uh, opinions from both sides? Why well, only one side? Yes, well I, well, I think this is a, a quite a broad question. Broad question, and, and personally, um, I believe that um, uh, it, it, uh, it boils down to, to <coughs> actually already to year 2007, when when uh, Putin gave a uh, speech in, in the Munich uh, Security Conference where he said that, uh, that uh, Russia and the BRICS countries, they will not stand for this uh, uh, unipolar world, uh, which, which uh, the, the, the many of the Western power players are planning. And, and, and this, this kind of uh, stepping uh, and saying that, no, we will not have it. We, will, we want to have a, a multipolar world. It has made Russia a target. And, and personally, I believe these uh, conflicts, such as the, uh, the Ukrainian uh, conflict and, and the Georgian conflict, are part of this uh, campaign to, uh, in one way or another, to, to um, let's say, change Russia's mind on this issue. I, I think the conflicts would go away quite fast if Russia said that, OK, yes, we will go along with, uh, with your plans and, and uh, it's all settled and so forth. So you, you are talking about Russia as a target. So you mean that uh, Russia is a target of aggression, actually? Yes, yes, I, I would say so. So we don't, we don't. Uh, fortunately, today we don't, we don't yet have any, any, let's say, direct uh, military action against Russia. But we have al already against Russian population, as in Donbas, uh, that the population is, is Russian. They are Russian speaking. Uh, over ninety percent of them speak Russian, and, and, and this is the this is the type of proxy warfare that is fought against Russia. Of course, Russia has stated in the past that they will look after the interests of Russian people abroad as well. And, uh, and, 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 and this makes it an easy target for, for these, um, these um, uh, Western powers to, to target. So it's, it's sort of a, it's, it's an easier target than, than attacking Russia, you know, head on. Uh, everyone understands that, that, then that, it, that has uh, grave consequences. Mm. Well, you said that uh, <coughs> Russians are a, a target of military aggression in Donbass. Yes. So could you tell us more about that and also about uh, war crimes by Ukraine? Hmm. by Ukrainian army? Well, yes, so uh, anyone who has been following the conflict from, from the beginning, of course, the, um, the Ukrainian government started an uh, um, anti-terrorist operation in the, in the Donbas region already in, in 2014, and, and that in included um, 
military operations against the, or against the population. And basically that operation has continu continued to this day. It has, uh, it has now settled at the Minsk II uh, ceasefire line, but uh, still, uh, and, and living there myself, I, I, I was a witness of, of many, many bombings and, uh, and rocket attacks. So basically we have this um, ongoing um, simmering conflict, which is not really a, an open conflict, but, but still uh, there is um, war crimes uh, co um, committed. So you are <coughs> talking about a military operation against the population of Donbass. So that sounds like a genocide, actually. Yes, I, I think you can you can actually call it with that name. So so we have a situation where uh, a population is targeted. I, I personally witnessed the the, the rocket attacks uh, or the consequences of rocket attacks on on uh, um, you know housing areas with no with no military installations. So so definitely you can you can come to the conclusion that civ civilian um, areas and civilians were targeted, and and this is a war crime by definition, and uh, and. Uh, and I suppose you can also use the, the term genocide in this. But uh, why Ukraine is continuing this uh, genocide against the civilian population of Donbass? Well, I, I think again, it, coming back to your previous question, uh, as, as long as, as Russia um, uh, stays with its stance that it will, uh, it will uh, want to see a world where, where uh, there is on not only one uh, um, point of power, but uh, rather a multi multipolar world, uh, this, this, this conflict will, will continue. That is not to say that, uh, let's say, that the, uh, the, the truth, which I believe is, is the worst enemy of, the, of, the, of these parties who are seeking this kind of unipolar world, will come out and it will, it will be their demise, because the people living in these countries that, uh, let's say, are actively uh, aiding Ukraine and aiding um, uh, or, or have sanctions against Russia, the, the population does not know about these even even about these terms, unipolar world and a multipolar world. So they are very uh, oblivious. And, and I think here we, we again come to the fact that, you know, they are not being told these things. They do not know that uh, they do not know what is happening. Mm. Yes. So, uh, Jarmo, you are a representative uh, secretary at the representative office of uh, Donetsk People's Republic in, mm. in Helsinki and in the Nordic countries in, in general. So what do you think is the task of this uh, representative office? Well, I would like to see that uh, that we can we can bring the voice uh, of of the um, of the area uh, um, uh, in in Don, on Don, Donbas and Donetsk uh, to to the Finnish population. So basically, uh, telling them first and foremost that such an uh, let's say area exists. I think this is quite common in the world that we're not always aware that uh, that a certain uh, you know place exists, and, and 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 this is the way this is the way that. Uh, um, people, uh, let's say, operate, we don't always know about things. But, you know, first and foremost, to tell about the situation, tell about the people that live there, you know, what are their ambitions, maybe they want to come here to study, maybe they want to come here and work, maybe they want to have some business relationships. So talk about prospects that people can really grasp and then, then we, can, uh, we, can have a, we can start a cooperation between, between them. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. I wish you success and thank you very much for the interview. Thank you. This was uh, Donetsk People's Republic uh, Press Centre, uh, representative office in Helsinki. And thank you for your company and hope to see you again soon.